One of the interesting things about uh, breaking through in the freedom philosophy or libertarianism is, um, and maybe you all have some of the same experiences, but you know, you learn the basic principles and the basic paradigm, but all of a sudden you hit up against an issue and you struggle with it and you say, wait a minute, now what about roads or what about uh, education? You know, what happens here? And, and then all of a sudden when you, when you think it through or you read a book, you go, ah, and it all tumbles into place and you say, wow, man, the, the paradigm really is consistent after all. And, I, and one, of the, uh, one of these common areas where this happens, I think, is in the antitrust, uh, in the antitrust area. You know, the, the, uh, the myths of the robber barons and, and big business in the 1800s and, and how uh, Standard Oil uh, monopolized the oil refinery business and how this is one area of peaceful activity and one area of business activity there where we really need government. Well, when I came up against this stumbling block, um, struggled with it, trying to figure it out on my own, and then I discovered uh, the books of Dominic Armentano, uh, books like The Myth of Antitrust and Antitrust and Monopoly. And there it was. I mean, everything just tumbled right into place. Uh, Armentano is probably the libertarian, the freedom movement's um, most recognized expert in the area of antitrust and for the reasons for repealing antitrust legislation. I met Dom some eight, nine years ago when he was a uh, member of the Board of Trustees at the Foundation for Economic Education. Uh, he did us a big honor five years ago by becoming a founding member of the Board of Trustees of the Future Freedom Foundation. He's the author of several books. He taught for many, many years uh, economics at the University of Hartford, uh, where he recently took an early retirement and moved down to Florida. Um, his articles and reviews have appeared in many, many scholarly journals, uh, as well as such newspapers as the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the London Financial Times, Public Choice, and Antitrust Bulletin. The title of Dom's talk is The Case for Repealing Antitrust Laws. If Walter Williams can take his jacket off, I guess I can. Well, I'm very happy to be here. I noticed the uh, flyer says halting the destruction of liberty. I thought we were here to reverse the trends. And so I, would, I thought Bumper was the most radical, uh, ran the most radical organization. That's why I joined it. But uh, it seems to me what we have to do is reverse the trends in liberty. We have to halt and reverse. And that's why I'm here to speak about repealing. It seems to me that's what uh, you get into when you start talking about repealing legislation. Uh, let me start, as I normally do, by giving a historical perspective on the antitrust laws. I think that there are two general theories about antitrust law. Or as Harold Demsitz once said, there are two beliefs about monopoly, two very different beliefs about antitrust and monopoly. I think the first belief we're, we're very familiar with, and this is the uh, proto-Marxian belief that in a free market, uh, business organizations will either grow internally to come to monopolize a market or will merge with each other to monopolize a market, or that Business organizations will conspire and collude to restrain trade, to fix prices, to reduce output, and generally to lower consumer welfare. And that competition, which presumably we depend on to promote the interest of consumers, will be reduced, perhaps even eliminated, so that you start with a free market you allow the competitive process or the free market to work, but then it ends up destroying itself. That there is a flaw, presumably, in market theory. And to fix that flaw, 
you have to have government regulation. So even if you don't start with government regulation, you end up bringing government back to protect competition, to promote, perhaps even to promote competition, to prevent firms from merging, to prevent one firm from dominating a market, to prevent firms from conspiring, to stop firms from engaging in tying agreements, to stop firms from price discriminating, to stop firms from engaging in resale price maintenance, all alleged business practices that harm consumer welfare. Now, what government policy is that? Well, that's antitrust policy. That's antitrust policy. A hundred years ago this year, the first major antitrust case went to the Supreme Court involving the American Sugar Refining Company. So we've had antitrust law at the federal level for a very, very long period of time. Sherman Act was passed in 1890, and the first major suit was settled at the Supreme Court level in 1895. Interestingly, by the way, although I'll talk about cases later, interestingly, the American Sugar Refining Company, which was the first major American corporation indicted under federal antitrust law and had 98% of the market, won its case in 1895, the Supreme Court declaring that uh, its activities were not interstate commerce and therefore did not come under the uh, uh, provisions of the, uh, of the antitrust law. And what's interesting about the American Sugar Refining Company is what happened to the monopoly position? What happened to the monopoly position? There was a free market, a relatively free market. There was a firm that had 98% of the market. There was a firm that lost its antitrust case, wasn't broken up by the government, wasn't splintered into its component parts, and yet, two, three, four, five, six, seven years later, there was no monopoly in the sugar market in the United States. In fact, sugar prices continued to fall after 1895 right into the, into the next century. So anyone that tells you that there's proof in the antitrust cases that you need antitrust regulation to promote competition or to save consumers, start with the first case, start with the sugar case and ask them what happened to the old sugar trust and why didn't the sugar trust dominate the sugar market and raise sugar prices and make exorbitant profit from then on because the government lost its case. That's, that's the oldest so-called public interest theory of antitrust policy, that in the public interest, in the consumer's interest, you need antitrust law because the, mar the, the competitive market has a fatal flaw. There are a lot of people that believe that theory. A lot of economists believe that. A lot of attorneys believe that. That, that, that public interest perspective has had wide support for years, for 90 years, almost uninterrupted. It had wide support. A little skepticism about that theory in the 1980s, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But uh, the public interest theory of antitrust is still firmly in place. If we took a trip three or four miles from here and, and went down to the antitrust division of the Justice Department or started poking around at the Federal Trade Commission, we would find many, many people, many, many attorneys, perhaps even most of the economists there who, who would say that. Got to worry about monopoly power, got to worry about mergers, need, quote, vigorous enforcement of antitrust law. Certainly we have a new Assistant Attorney General, Ann Bingaman, who believes in antitrust with a vengeance. She has beefed up the uh, antitrust division. There are 100 more attorneys and paralegals there now than there were two years ago, 100 more. So we're going to, as, as you, most of you know, get some vigorous antitrust activity again in the 1990s. There's, there's an alternative theory of antitrust law. I still think very definitely the minority vision of antitrust. And that's that there is no free market problem at all. And you don't need government regulation to, uh, to deal with a, with a non-existent problem. That antitrust law exists because private interests can use the law to prevent to restrict and to restrain competition, the very opposite, the very opposite of the public interest perspective. That antitrust law is protectionist of the existing market structure. 
that firms use antitrust against other firms. Not because the other firms are engaging in monopolistic practices. Why the heck would a competitor sue another firm that's engaged in a monopolistic practice? Why wouldn't that competitor simply enjoy the advantages of that monopolistic practice? What we mean by a monopolistic practice in economics is a restraint of output and a higher price. If I were a competitor and firm X was doing that, I would enjoy the advantages of that. I wouldn't sue that firm under the antitrust law, what percentage would there be in that? All, almost all, the firms that sue other firms are complaining not about monopoly power, but about the lack of it. They're complaining about competition. They're typically suing a more efficient organization for doing more efficient things in the market as far as the consumers are concerned. That's what they're upset about. It's interesting in the recently settled Microsoft case, the, the, the criticism of Microsoft and the criticism of the consent decree that the Justice Department signed with Microsoft didn't come from the users, it came from the competitors. Most of the competitors said, you know, the government didn't go far enough. They wanted Microsoft broken up, they wanted a wall uh, put in between the, the applications and, and, and uh, the complaints were from the competitors, notably IBM in that case, not from the, not from the users. This is very typical. 95, as I always, always tell my students, 95% of all antitrust action is one firm suing another firm. Only 5% of the cases that are brought, historically, are brought by the government. Those may be public interest cases, although they don't have a public interest consequence, as I'll show you when we, when we uh, do some case histories in a minute. But certainly the bulk of antitrust has nothing to do with the public interest. It's one firm suing another, normally complaining about some practice which has an efficiency consequence that injures the plaintiff. So there's two very different theories about what antitrust is all about. Public interest and private interest or sometimes called the public choice theory of antitrust. Now most of us, most of the real serious critics, I think, of antitrust policy subscribe to the, to the latter vision, uh, that that's what antitrust is all about. And I think there's some historical evidence, in fact, that that is what it is about. Uh, that if you, if, you, if you research the origins of antitrust law, state antitrust law, you, start, you should start there. And even the federal law, that uh, even though there might have been public interest rhetoric, that the bulk of the real uh, push for antitrust legislation at the state and federal level was in fact from disgruntled competitors who were anxious to stymie and restrict the activities of the larger, in some cases larger, more efficient firms. And the best example of that, of course, would be in the petroleum industry and the uh, uh, Standard Oil Company. The public interest perspective on antitrust dominated people's thinking about antitrust between 1890 and roughly 1975. There was very little criticism of antitrust policy. Now you would think in the libertarian movement, even in the Austrian economics movement, there would have been criticism, severe criticism of antitrust policy. Not so. Not so. Even, even such luminaries as Ludwig von Mises and Frederick Hayek are ambiguous with respect to their position on antitrust law. Now, you would expect that ambiguity with, let's say, Chicago school economists who have always been ambiguous about antitrust policy. But you would not expect it from people like Hayek. And yet, if you read the Constitution of Liberty and you read what Hayek has to say about antitrust policy, you don't get the feeling that he's a critic at all. You get the feeling that, in fact, he thinks that's a legitimate governmental policy. So antitrust policy enjoyed wide bipartisan support from the liberals, from the middle of the road, from the conservatives generally, people like George Stigler, uh, Nobel Prize winner. I'm told, you know, late in his life, he started to rethink his, his views on antitrust, but I, I find nothing in the literature that would lead me to believe that he ever gave up his belief that antitrust is necessary to maintain competition in a, in a free society. Now, beginning in the, in, the, in the 70s, there were 
critical articles published about antitrust enforcement. Some were very theoretical, and a lot of casework was done. And beginning, as I say, roughly in 1975, you had a, a revisionist movement. And I think it had some effect. I think it had some effect. I think it had effect, for example, on the thinking of some people in the administrative agencies. Certainly when Ronald Reagan came in, he appointed people that were sympathetic to the anti-antitrust vision. That if you really want to have a competitive free market economy, you need less antitrust, not more antitrust. William Baxter was one of those people. He was a UC, UC, uh, St I'm sorry, Stanford uh, law professor and certainly held that position. He became the Assistant Attorney General of the United States. The first important thing he did in the antitrust area was drop the IBM case. You had over at the Federal Trade Commission Jim Miller, who was, again, a very anti-antitruster. You also had judges, particularly at the district court level, being, being re-educated, if you will, uh, about antitrust policy, about antitrust theory, and about antitrust policy. So you had, in the 1980s, a deregulation in the antitrust area. You had many, many fewer private cases brought. And you had, you had fewer federal cases brought. Uh, and antitrust went into a decline for eight years, 1980 to 1988. In fact, I thought that was the end of it. I thought that was the end of it. Um, I wasn't quite sure it was the end of it. I wrote a book for Cato. It came out in 84, where I argued the law should be repealed. In fact, that's been my position since 1972. In fact, the book was called Antitrust Policy, the Case for Repeal. And I warned the Chicago school people and, and other critics of antitrust that maybe we ought to kill it uh, before it comes back again at, at some later point. And I was reassured constantly that this would never happen, uh, that the theoretical arguments against antitrust policy were now understood by everybody, that Armentano, the war was over. Uh, we don't have to stick you know, a wooden stake in the heart of antitrust. It, 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 will, it will never come back. Well, sure as hell, it has come back. Uh, so we, we, we had a decline for eight years. There was a lull during the Bush administration, but certainly since Clinton and since Janet Reno and uh, Ann Bingaman, uh, antitrust policy is back with a vengeance. We have all sorts of cases. We have all, all sorts of subpoenas. Uh, we have an ongoing case involving GE and the Beers right now, and uh, a whole slew of so-called consent decrees, which I want to speak about later. Uh, so antitrust is, uh, is busy again. The, the private antitrust bar couldn't be happier. They've got big smiles on their face. In fact, the Wall Street Journal reported that Ann Bingaman said to a group of private antitrust attorneys, uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to make sure your kids uh, have enough money to go to college. And that, that's about it. You, now you understand, in blatant, if that's an accurate quote, what the heck antitrust is all about. I'm going to make sure your kids go, go to college. Uh, Now, my position, as I stated, is that antitrust laws should be repealed. Let me speak briefly about the case for repeal. I think the case for repeal can be broken down into three areas. I think one area is certainly a, um, a moral argument. And even though I'm, a, I'm an economist, I'm going to make a moral argument against antitrust. I think there's a theoretical case against antitrust, any antitrust policy. And I think there's a so-called empirical or case argument against antitrust policy. So let me start with the so-called moral argument against antitrust policy. I think the moral argument is a fairly straightforward one, and you either accept it or you don't. And of course, I'm speaking to a fairly friendly audience. Uh, as most of us would recognize, the purpose and function of law of appropriate law, of good law, is to protect people's rights, to protect property rights, to protect individual rights. That's the purpose of law. So if you have a law that doesn't protect property rights, that doesn't protect individual rights, the right to make decisions with respect to the use of your own life and your own property, then you've got bad law. 
then you've got immoral law. Antitrust law, by its very nature, interferes with peaceful exchange. It interferes with individual property rights. If A and B, who own indi individually two different firms, decide that they're going to produce a product together or charge the same prices or not compete or price discriminate or make tying agreements with each other, that activity, although some economists may, may find it, and we'll, we'll deal with this in a minute, anti-competitive, that activity is peaceful activity. It does not involve a violation of rights. These are agreements. These are agreements, and by definition, agreements are voluntary. To interfere with voluntary agreements is to violate the rights of the individual business people involved. So when you tell me I can't fix my prices, when you tell me I can't price discriminate, or I can't merge, you're violating my rights to do things that are peaceful. It's like telling me that I can't marry whom I want to, or I can't do the research that I want to, or I can't meet with colleagues and discuss antitrust policy. You know, if intellectuals faced regulations that told them that they couldn't do research or they couldn't, or, the, or their speaking fees would be regulated or that their correspondence would be monitored, they'd scream like heck and say, that's immoral. You can't do that, government. You're violating my rights. Yet those same intellectuals in the antitrust area never, and I mean never, recognize the gross violations of substantive rights that occur in the antitrust area all the time. So there are substantive rights violations involved in having and enforcing any, any antitrust policy. Think about all the provisions of the antitrust laws. Conspiring to fix prices is making an agreement. Merging is making an agreement. Price discriminating is charging prices to A lower or higher than you charge to B. Those are, those are voluntary agreements. A tying contract is an agreement that says, I'll sell you A on condition that you buy B. You don't have to buy A and B from me, but if you buy A, you must buy B. Those are agreements. People are free to enter into them or not enter into them. So when the laws regulate that activity, they regulate agreements and therefore are inherently violative of people's rights. So I think there's a strong moral case, although very few economists will attempt to make it, a strong moral case against any antitrust law. There's also a procedural uh, moral issue. That, that, what I've just referred to I will call a substantive moral issue. There's also a procedural moral issue. And the procedural moral issue is every businessman out there in the economy doesn't really know what the heck is illegal from day to day. You don't know when or under what conditions you are violating the law. You live in some sense in gross uncertainty. We almost, all, almost always find out what's illegal after the fact, after the case when the court drops the ruling down and rationalizes it in some way. Because you charge prices that were too high or that were the same as everybody else or were, that, or, or, or were too low. So there's tremendous uncertainty in the antitrust area. In fact, this is why for the most part, most firms say the heck with it. You want us to do something, we'll do it. You want us to sign an agreement, a consent decree, we'll, we'll, we'll sign it. You want us to raise our price? Firms that are charged with price discriminating are almost always charging prices too low for the government. So they go to the government and say, you want us to raise our prices? All right, we'll do it. We're not gonna, we're not gonna, we're not gonna spend three or four million dollars uh, and fight you in court not knowing whether we're gonna win or lose. And if we lose anyway, we're gonna have to raise our price. You want us to raise our price, we'll raise it. So there's this procedural, if you will, immorality. Uh, there is no rule of law, not really, in the antitrust area. It's made every day. It used to be made every day. And that would be another reason to oppose antitrust. So regardless of the alleged efficiency of antitrust law, and we'll get to that in a minute, I don't think it is efficient, but regardless of the alleged efficiency 
It's immoral. It's immoral law. It interferes with rights, and it's, and it's ambiguous in the extreme, and therefore should be repealed on, the, on those grounds alone. Now, I know this is not an economics class, and I will not get terribly technical with you about either theory or cases, but certainly the case against antitrust depends not on the moral argument for most people. For us it might, but not for most people. When I'm talking to colleagues, I'm not going to get into the moral uh, difficulties of antitrust law. They, don't, they simply don't understand, or if they do, they don't care. What they want to know about is theory and practice, theory and practice. Well, let's talk a little bit about monopoly theory. I think that's where you have to start. In The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith talks about monopoly. And most of the time, almost all the time, he's talking about monopoly in The Wealth of Nations. He's talking about government legally restricting entry exit and or competition in the marketplace. Creating government, creating monopoly or near monopoly positions for certain individuals, for certain families, for certain firms. The playing card monopoly, the mail monopoly in America, that was a grant, that was a grant, a monopoly grant from the crown to the Neal family, to the Thomas Neal family. The Thomas Neal family in the colonial period had the legal right to carry the mail. No one else had that right. And Smith said, I'm against monopoly. How can monopoly be in the interest of the consumers? How can granting a privilege to a family or to a firm and prohibiting free entry into the market possibly give you the competitive price, give you a fair price. Now, how do you get rid of that kind of monopoly? You don't either, A, make the grants of privilege, or if you've made them, you rescind them. So deregulation in the wealth of nations, deregulation, and uh, this was, of course, true in the 1970s and 80s, deregulation is the way to a free market. The regulations exist, you deregulate. By the way, this would also apply to antitrust policy. If the antitrust policy is regulation, then you deregulate. That's how you get to a free market. If you want a free market in mergers, deregulate. Get rid of the Federal Trade Commission. Get rid of the Justice Department. Gut their authority to bring legal suit against a merger. So there is a theory of monopoly in Smith. There is a theory of monopoly in, in classical economics. Most of it spins around the idea that government is the problem. Only government can, le after all, legally restrict entry. And if you want competition, or, you, or I'm sorry, if you want a free market, you just remove government regulation. Now, what about antitrust policy? Did Adam Smith think antitrust policy was necessary? You've now, let's say, deregulated. You now have a free market. Do you need antitrust policy to protect the free market? We get back to my public interest theory. No. No. Interestingly, Adam Smith talks about businessmen frequently getting together to fix prices. The most famous quote from The, the Wealth of Nations is, is Smith's bitter uh, commentary on how businessmen are always colluding to, to fix prices and restrain competition. The very next line, the very next sentence, which most economists have never read, is that Smith says, I would make no law against it. Because he says, I can't think of a law against those agreements that, quote, would be consistent with liberty and justice. What a great libertarian line. I can't think of a law, I'm paraphrasing, I can't think of a law that would be consistent with liberty and justice. So no, we don't need an antitrust law. So one theory of monopoly is antitrust is irrelevant. You don't need antitrust. What you need is to deregulate the economy, and then you will have a free market. But what about this second theory? Remember, I started off the, the talk with Dems, Harold Demsitz, who's a, a UCLA economist. Harold Demsitz's statement that there are two beliefs about monopoly. What about this other theory of monopoly? Well, the other theory of monopoly is the so-called free market theory. Forget about government regulation. Couldn't, in fact, a firm come to have a 
a monopoly position in the market. And there have been firms historically, I gave you an example at the, at the, at the start of the talk, there have been firms that have had high market shares. Of course, talking about monopoly begs a lot of questions. We have to define the relevant market. We have to define the nature of the product. We have to get into discussions about whether we're talking about a domestic market or international market. But put those aside for the moment. Couldn't the firm come to have 98% of a market, 100% of a market? American Sugar Refining did. Alcoa did. Aluminum Company of America had, for all intents and purposes, uh, a monopoly in the, in the production of, of uh, primary ingot aluminum for 50 years, not just for a day or two, but for 50 years, nobody except Alcoa produced and sold in the United States primary ingot aluminum. Now, what's the argument there? Well, the argument there can, can, can I think, go something like this. And, and all of this is to be done in depth. We're not going to do it here. How did the firm obtain its monopoly? And how does the firm maintain its monopoly? Those are relevant questions. Look, if I'm the government and I take firm A and I give firm A a monopoly and protect firm A from competition, that's how the firm got its monopoly. In other words, the market did not justify or rationalize that market share. That's important. It's important to say that. It's important to understand that. On the other hand, if I'm Alcoa, and I have invested tremendous amounts of capital in new technology, and I have pioneered all sorts of innovational activity that have reduced costs dramatically and reduced the price of the product, and it's that process, that competitive process, that keeps other firms from being able to make agreements with consumers. That's a very different story. Look, I thought we were supposed to be interested in consumer welfare. Well, let's pay attention to the consumers. If I've got that kind of a monopoly, I haven't done anything wrong. And that's what, of course, Alcoa did. When Alcoa sold aluminum in 1888, they sold it for $5 an ingot pound. When they sold it in 1937, and the government was all over them in 1937, they were selling it for 22 cents an ingot pound. And when the president of the firm was put on the stand, he was asked to explain the monopoly, he said, well, we've reduced our cost and we've reduced our prices and we don't have anybody that wants to compete with us. There are bigger firms. Henry Ford wants to produce aluminum. He'd rather buy it from us, though, because he doesn't think he can make any money at 22 cents a pound. Henry Ford was smart. He shouldn't have competed with Alcoa, and he didn't. So it makes a difference how you get the monopoly and how you maintain it. If a firm is inefficient, it will not either gain the monopoly position, and then we have a non-issue, or it will lose its, its market position, and then you, again, you don't need any antitrust case. If Alcoa had been inefficient, AA would never have gained their high market share, and B, if they had been inefficient, they would have lost it. So what's, the, what's antitrust policy for? What do we need antitrust for? No, antitrust was used against Alcoa because Alcoa was a, an efficient, a large efficient firm. And it was harassed for 13 years, as have many firms been harassed. The list is long, but if we're talking about near monopoly positions, that's, that's probably the case you would want to look at. By the way, Alcoa was never a monopoly. I went through graduate school thinking that Alcoa was a good monopoly, but they were never a monopoly. They had hundreds of competitors. And you have to read the district court decision to find that out. There were hundreds of firms that sold an identical product. It wasn't called primary ingot aluminum, it was called secondary ingot aluminum, but it was absolutely chemically identical to primary. So the government, the government had defined the market so that Alcoa was the only firm. But if you would define the market rationally and including, included goods that were perfect substitutes for Alcoa's product, you would have included these hundreds of other firms. And then what would Alcoa's market share have been? 100%? No, 33%. They would never have been taken to court with a 33% market share, but that was their real market share. Sometimes law professors don't let their students read the district court's cases. Got to read the district court. Got to read the trial court cases. That's where the, that's where the stuff is. 
the Supreme Court's over in the clouds philosophizing about this and that. You've got to get into the district court case and hear a judge say, as he said in Alcoa, there are hundreds of other competitors. Alcoa doesn't have a monopoly share. What the hell's the government talking about? That judge found Alcoa innocent of 152 charges, 152 to nothing, and the government lost that case at the district court level, and they won on appeal. Well, how about a monopoly, though, that isn't efficient? How about a monopoly that raises prices and makes a lot of money? Well, the argument there, as most of you know, is, well, if that happens, they're going to have competitors. That monopoly profits are going to attract firms into the market and customers are going to be anxious to make agreements with competitors and uh, there ain't going to be any monopoly. Now, there's a time period there. And we could get into a debate about whether it's, quote, more efficient to have antitrust policy move against the inefficient monopoly or whether we should let the market take apart inefficient monopoly. My study of the evidence is don't use government. That the market is, is efficient at taking apart inefficiency. How about collusion? Well, this is a whole other area. But in some ways it's not, because the issue is the same. The issue is monopoly, because after all, that's what the colluders are trying to do. Firm A and Firm B, although they don't merge, let's say, to make a monopoly, are trying to make a monopoly price by colluding. So you have the same problems with collusion that you have with monopoly, only more so, because if you've got independent firms trying to fix prices, you've always got the problem of cheating. You've always got the problem of cheating and enforcing the agreement. My study of the history of antitrust cases in the price fixing area is that businessmen cheat, thank goodness that their concern for their own self-interest and the self-interest of the firm leads them to attempt to mislead their competitor, that they're charging the, the monopoly price, but grant the discount, cut the price, and do more business, as long as, hopefully, the, the competitor doesn't discover that. But, of course, the competitor does. These agreements almost always come apart. Unless they're enforced, unless there's legal enforceability, private cartel agreements really don't work. I think there's good theoretical evidence that they don't, and I think there's good empirical evidence that they don't work. Doug Ginsburg, who is a judge, in a reply to an article I wrote, said, well, when I was at the Justice Department, we found all kinds of price-fixing agreements, and they lasted a very long period of time. Here's Armentano saying in this article that price-fixing agreements don't last. That's not the issue. Judge Ginsburg. The issue is not did they last, the issue is did they work? Were they effective? Was competition, was trade restrained? Was the market monopolized? Were the monopoly prices achieved? Not did businessmen make agreements, break agreements, make agreements, break agreements? Hey, they do that. What, did, what happened prior to antitrust law? Look, go back into the pre-1890 period. Could you make a, a, a conspiracy, a, a price fixing agreement with your competitor? Of course you could. Was it illegal? No. Did they work? No. The best evidence that we can have a world without antitrust law and have it be competitive is to go back to the pre-1890 period. There's been a lot of research done on that period by Tom DiLorenzo and others, which would indicate that that was an extremely competitive period despite the fact that you could make Price fixing agreements. Railroads made them all the time, broke them all the time. Steel companies made them all the time, broke them all the time. Most of my work has been in, in cases. When I started teaching at the University of Hartford, they handed me an antitrust course, and I hadn't done a lot of antitrust work as a, as a student. I'd had one graduate course in antitrust. And I had to find a textbook. And I, I, I think there were only two or three then 
textbooks that you could use in the antitrust area, and they were all the same. And what they essentially said is, uh, you know, we need antitrust law, and the proof is in the cases. Standard Oil, American Tobacco, Alcoa, U.S. Steel, uh, the, the proof is in the cases that firms really do abuse their power, and the, and the proof for that, the evidence for that, is in the antitrust cases. The government brought these cases, broke these firms apart because they were doing, they were doing bad things, as far as consumers were concerned. And that's pretty much where I started. But when I had to teach the course, I thought I'd do a little work and go and actually read some of these cases. Rather than trust the secondary source, I, I'd, I'd go read the case. I remember going over to the state capitol in Connecticut many, many years ago, and I said, I want to see the Standard Oil trial brief. <laughs> and the, and the, the law librarian almost died. I mean, no one had ever asked him for the Standard Oil trial brief. He was way up in the attic. You know, 10,000 pages long. Connecticut was one of the, I think there, was, there were seven libraries at the time that had the Standard Oil trial uh, record. So I got into the antitrust cases. I started with uh, sugar, the sugar case, which is the first major case. I spent a lot of time with the petroleum industry and the Standard Oil Company. I got very into the uh, tobacco industry. The history of that industry, fascinating history, and the American Tobacco Company, the rise and, uh, of that firm. I studied the steel industry. These are all major American industries, and there are major monopoly cases in every one of them. And of course, aluminum. And instead of finding that in free markets, and these markets were relatively free, I mean, you can never say absolutely free, and there's always some regulation, some tariff. But these markets were relatively free. The petroleum industry is a good example. Relatively free market between 1860 and 1911. Was Standard Oil able to monopolize that market and raise prices? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Where's the evidence that they did that? In 1911, when they were broken up, there were 147 petroleum refiners in the United States. Standard Oil of New Jersey was one of them. There are 146 other firms. Their market share at that point, 1911, was about 64%. It had been in steady decline for about 19 years. Almost all the history, the histories that are done of the antitrust cases are done by attorneys. They're done by lawyers. They stay away from the specific economic evidence. They stay away from price evidence, they stay away from output evidence, they stay away from numbers of competitors evidence. So when I wrote The Myths of Antitrust in 1972, I wrote it as an economist around that evidence. And what I was finding I thought was remarkable because I couldn't find it in any other text that in fact the major firms that, that had lost their monopoly cases hadn't lost them because they'd restrained trade. There was no evidence in the case that they had. They had expanded their outputs dramatically. They had lowered prices, costs and prices dramatically. They had innovated. And in fact, that's probably what got them in trouble. What could be more immoral if you're talking about morality than to bring a legal action against the firm that does those kinds of things? The only thing more immoral probably is businessmen not getting up and, and saying, hey, you're punishing us for our virtues. I wish I could say businessmen are, are brave and, uh, and, and support me and others in this area. They don't. My, my, my most hostile audiences, typically, are business audiences. They're cowardly when it comes to that. And yet they, they, shouldn't, they shouldn't be ashamed of, their, of, of business history, generally. Because there's nothing in the major antitrust cases that would lead you to believe that free, mar free market monopoly is a serious problem that requires antitrust regulation. Well, let me, let me wrap this up so we can get some questions. The, the first part of my talk was historical. The second part is morality, theory, and cases. The third part is just to talk a little bit about the future of antitrust. We're going to see more antitrust policy. We're going to see uh, an activist policy on the part of the Clinton administration. I, I think we're going we're to go beyond that. 
And what I mean by that is there are certain areas of the economy that are, quote, immune from antitrust law. Then two major areas of immunity are insurance and baseball. <laughs> now, you already know the baseball story. Almost everybody, although it didn't pass, almost everybody in Congress believes that that's an outmoded exemption. Certainly the justification that was given in 1922 for the baseball exemption from the antitrust law doesn't make any sense, that it's not interstate commerce. Of course it's interstate commerce. That's not the reason why you want to exempt base professional baseball from antitrust law. You want to exempt professional baseball and insurance from antitrust law because of all the reasons I've spoken to you tonight about. Because antitrust enforcement doesn't make any theoretical or empirical sense. And you don't want to apply bad law to areas that have had not had that application. The application of antitrust laws to the insurance industry would be absolutely disastrous for consumers. Now, the antitrust bar is licking its chops. They can't wait. There'd be hundreds of suits, thousands of suits, perhaps, if the antitrust laws were uh, applied to the insurance industry. There are 3,500 insurance companies. They do all kinds of things that look like, quote, they violate the antitrust law. There'd be a feeding frenzy. So, of course, the anti private antitrust attorneys can't wait. But does it make any, any theoretical or empirical sense to apply the laws there? No. If you've got an exemption, great, keep it. Now, having said that, what's happening? The industry is giving it up. They're giving up the fight. They're giving up the fight. They've, they've maintained a pretty good fight from 1945 when they got the McCarran Act, which exempts them from antitrust law, until the present, but they're giving up the fight. So I think if we're looking through the 1990s, I think what's going to happen is the insurance industry is going to lose its antitrust exemption, exemption and, I'm, I'm, and I'm quite sure baseball will too. So the two major areas of, of exemption probably will, will go. So not only will we get more antitrust out of the Federal Trade Commission and the Justice Department, we will also get, I think, the Congress moving not to repeal antitrust law, which is what I want, but to expand the antitrust law. Very discouraging for someone like myself who's been in the field for many, many years. Very discouraging uh, to see people actually talking about expanding antitrust law when there's nothing in theory, nothing in practice, and certainly nothing in, in, in any moral argument that would lead you to believe that, uh, that we need it. And yet, it, it's a hard nut to crack. Even my own father, I can't convince. I can't convince my own father that we should do away the antitrust law. Most of us have probably had this experience. We know something is absolutely wrong. We articulate it as best we can. We write thousands and thousands of pages. But within our own family, within our own family, there's a shaking of the head. Old beliefs die hard. And frankly, I'm not optimistic that antitrust will ever be abolished. I favor the abolishment of it. I want to not just halt the decline of liberty, but reverse it. But frankly, I'm at a loss to know at this point what the strategy is, other than more of the same, what the strategy is for getting that reversal. And maybe we can deal with that in the question and answer period. Thank you very much. Uh, what's the status of antitrust laws in foreign countries and how do you compete against companies, overseas companies, who don't have to, to comply with antitrust laws? Excellent question. Uh, some firms complain that they have less freedom in America than firms have in other countries uh, and that the antitrust laws domestically uh, hurt them in competition with, uh, with foreign firms. Uh, I think there's some truth to that. Uh, most countries have antitrust law. The Americans really pioneered antitrust law. Most countries adopted uh, antitrust law, but it, it's not it simply enforced as vigorously in most countries. In Japan, they have an elaborate antitrust structure, but for the most part, I think I can safely say this, it's ignored. So the firms are allowed to do things in Japan that they're not allowed to do here, and I think those things are efficient things, and I think, uh, therefore, foreign firms, everything else equal, would have a marginal efficiency advantage because of domestic antitrust law. Now, I don't think if you repealed antitrust law that you would change uh, 
you know, there'd be a dramatic change in competitiveness. That's not what I'm saying. I think it's a marginal factor, though. It's a, it's a, ne a marginal negative factor. I didn't hear you mention anything about the AT&T breakup. Would you say a few words about that? Well, it's hard to say a few words about that. <laughs> That's an interesting case. That's an interesting case. My general position has to be I would not have favored the legal breakup of American Telephone and Telegraph. Uh, I think the bulk of the advantages, economic advantages that have flowed from that breakup, legal breakup, could have been achieved, would have been achieved through deregulation of telecommunications. And in fact, I think the evidence is, is that, that, that the dramatic deregulation of telecommunications has produced dr a dramatic, a dramatic advantages for consumers. And I think the bulk of those advantages would have been achieved without the breakup. Uh, on the other hand, AT&T was not a free market firm. I mean, we have to understand that, that if we had to pick out one firm that had, quote, enjoyed the advantages of protectionism, legal protectionism, longer than perhaps than any other firm, you would have picked out AT&T. So in some sense, there's some, you're, you're going to have to forgive me for this. I mean, in some sense, there's some justice uh, in, in, in doing that to AT&T. I mean, they were a strong advocate of government regulation, very hostile to free markets. And uh, uh, in, in some sense, there's a, there's a, a, a ironical kind of fairness in, in uh, the fact that they got broken up. But no, I would not have brought a suit against them. Uh, certainly, there have been major uh, you know, economies and efficiencies that have flowed from the breakup. But as I say, I think they would have flowed from deregulation rather than uh, they would have been achieved uh, that way. I would, have been, I would have preferred to have them achieved that way. Could you comment on trademark laws, patent laws, and copyright laws, and also when will the airlines uh, get us back into being a uh, uh, regulated industry? I wrote an article for the, let me comment on the second part of that, and it remind me about the first part of the question. I wrote an article for the Wall Street Journal a number of years ago where I said, all right, we're deregulating the air carrier industry, and that's great. We should deregulate this industry, get the civil aeronautics board out of the way, let them fr free market price and so forth. But, but, if you really want to create a free market, you not only have to give firms the right to compete, you have to give them the right to cooperate. Everybody talks about competition, almost no one talks about cooperation. Look, these are, as far as I'm concerned, left hand, right hand posi uh, positions. And I, and I argued in that article, and we got a, all sorts of flack. I'm surprised the journal published it. I argued in that article that at the same time you deregulate the air carriers, you have to give them the right to cooperate, to, if you want to use the term, collude. Because what, what, I, what I argued there is you're going to get tremendous price instability in this industry, and you're going to lose the bulk of, of the carriers. And then what's going to happen? The push for regulation is going to happen. And someone's going to come along and say, well, the free market doesn't work. That ain't the free market, people. That's not the free market. Free market is cooperation and open markets. So we opened the markets, but did not allow and do not allow the firms to cooperate. In fact, we've had major illegal harassment of the air carriers by the government. At the same time, they're losing $9 billion, more money than they earned from 1938 to the present. They've lost in the last four years. At the same time, they've lost massive amounts of money. The government's been suing them for alleged antitrust violations. Uh, absolutely crazy. So I, 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 that, that's an excellent question. And we're going to lose our, our free, allegedly free market air carrier industry unless, although it's very controversial, unless we allow the firms to engage in some price fixing. Uh, that may not be the best of all worlds, but it's better than having uh, the CAB come back in and start regulating rates and routes again. I don't think we want to go back to that. The first part of the question dealt with patents and copyrights. I think copyrights are, are consistent with uh, property rights and belong in a, certainly belong in a free market. Uh, and I think patents can be, I think patent law can be changed to be consistent with uh, 
with what most of us would accept as, as, a, as a legitimate property right. Uh, a patent is a, is, a, uh, is a property right. That's the way we should say it. Now what it does, of course, what patent law does is prohibit the so-called independent second discoverer from having his rights recognized. And I think, what, I think that ought to be changed at some point. So I would not throw the baby out with the bathwater. I don't think we want to throw patent law out completely. I think we want to make patent law more like copyright law and recognize everyone's independent uh, right to discovery and, uh, and allow that to be protected, allow that to be a legitimate property right. Uh, doctor, um, first I want to say that I can certainly sympathize with your relationship with your father. My mom still thinks that Lyndon LaRouche is a libertarian. <laughs> um, You've got more problems than I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is, were not the antitrust laws a reaction and maybe a predictable, if wrong-headed, reaction to earlier limited liability licensing corporate franchising type legislation? And would not uh, the repeal of the antitrust uh, make much more sense if simultaneously we tried to repeal those? Never heard that question before. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I, I certainly would not want to repeal limited liability law. Why would you want to do that? After all, we're talking about limited liability for shareholders, not for the corporations. Corporations have full liability. Only the shareholders have limited liability. So I'm not sure I would want to necessarily engage in... in, uh, in well... I, I agree that, that there are market ways to achieve the result, but I don't, I don't think it's a rights violating, uh, I wouldn't call it a privilege, frankly. I think, I think that, I think limited liability can, and if you read Bob Hessen's book in Defense of the Corporation, certainly limited liability can be and has been achieved in the market. The government comes along and sort of uh, uh, recognizes the market limitation of liability. Just like, as Bob says in his book, the government comes along and recognizes marriage. So I don't think limited liability is, a, is, a, is, is necessarily a privilege. And I really don't see the connection. Well, well if, if you're talking about licensing the way I'm talking about it, certainly I'm against uh, licensing. I'm against all occupational licensing, and all government licensing. Could be some of that. If, if you accept the public interest theory, could be some of that. But if you accept my alternate theory, uh, the private interest theory, the so-called public choice theory, then that would not have played a role. No, I think I think I, th I think there's, there was some of that certainly. Uh, in 1890, re re as you'll recall, the the Congress passed the McKinley uh, Tariff Act. Which, which created monopoly privilege for business. And in fact, some people say that the, the passage of the antitrust law was to, uh, you know, was to, was to uh, uh, make the Republicans who, who supported the, ter the Tariff Act look like they were against monopoly. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's, certainly, there's certainly something to be said for that, uh, that there, there was a reaction to, to privilege, to the tariff privilege, uh, the licensing privilege, sure. Tom, you just opened an idea to me. If is there any law against a, a Japanese baseball team and a Japanese insurance company coming in here? If this place is going to get antitrust, they'd come in here and it wouldn't be under our law, would they? Couldn't we have a lot of Japanese baseball? Oh no, firms that operate here, regardless of uh, whether they're Japanese or not, are subject to American antitrust law. Especially, in, especially in, well, the insurance company would not be subject to antitrust law, but would be subject to all kinds of other law. I mean, there's, there's other law that affects the insurance industry. It's a state regulated industry, so they'd have to get a license from, let's say, the state of New York to operate. They'd have to meet certain capital requirements and so forth. Um, I, I, don't, I don't control the selection. <laughs> <laughs> well, bear with me just a moment, and then you may have a turn. Um, 
Is your source of pessimism against repeal of the antitrust laws based on uh, the businessman's refusal to fight them or due to the perhaps a bias of the court? Actually, the courts recently have been reasonably good on antitrust issues. I mean, they don't, they're not for repeal, don't get me wrong. But the Justice Department in the last five years has lost, I think, something like 11 out of 13 cases. Now, that's absolutely unprecedented. I mean, if you went back to the 50s and 60s, even on into the early 70s, they won most of their cases. So as I said in my talk, I think there's been a lot of re-education, particularly at the district court and appellate court level, and Robert Bork's probably resp more responsible for this than anyone else, uh, because Bork's uh, antitrust book is, you know, is, is, a, is, a, is widely read still, the antitrust paradox. Uh, so I, it wouldn't be the courts. Uh, there's, there's no political percentage in it. I mean, there's no political percentage in any senator or any representative speaking out against the antitrust law. Uh, from a cost-benefit perspective, it just doesn't make any sense. And, you, it, and we understand this. You can't, therefore, expect them to do it. Uh, and certainly, the agencies are very interested in expanding their power. And as I say, the antitrust bar has been sitting around for a number of years with literally nothing to do. They're, and they're terribly excited about <laughs> the new antitrust effort. So, that's why I'm pessimistic. I mean, I, I think I understand public choice theory, and I think I understand where the costs and benefits are. And unless the American public somehow can see through this, uh, and you throw out, you know, all the bad guys and put in all the good guys, uh, it, it ain't going to happen. If I could press a button, and antitrust would, you know, could disappear, I'd press the button. I've always told my classes that. But the point is, there is no, there is no such button. It can't be pushed because it doesn't exist. We've made some progress in antitrust policy. I don't think we'll get the real dumb, stupid cases that we've had in the past. We'll get new dumb, stupid cases. They'll be, they'll be slightly smaller, sl slightly more intelligent at the margin. Uh, but it, it won't go, it probably won't go away. Other questions? Um, well, you just answered part of my question, but uh, I wanted to preface my question with a quote by Walter Williams since you referred to him earlier. He addressed his uh, first semester undergraduate microeconomics class uh, in the following way after the first midterm. He said, if you pass this midterm with a C or better, you know more than anybody on Capitol Hill about economics. <laughs> and <laughs> And um, along those lines, what I wanted to ask you was, do you think that um, congressmen have read or heard of your book? It's such a hard-hitting, factual book, and it's in the title, it's so evident what the book's about. It's not immersed in a, in a libertarian book about 50 other items. And so I wonder, uh, have you been called to uh, speak before Congress on any of these issues? Do you think it's really a matter of ignorance only, or you know, that it really is a, you know, conspiracy I don't think it's, I don't think it's ignorance. I'm going to have to disagree with, with Walter. Uh, I, re I really would disagree with Walter. I don't think it's ignorance at all. I think, I think people understand how things work. I think Senator Kennedy, for example, knows uh, that antitrust law really uh, doesn't work. Robert Reich, the Secretary of Labor, re read the work of nations, extremely hostile to uh, any antitrust policy at all. In fact, he was at the University of Hartford about a year ago, and there was a small group of us, and I, I asked him specifically, I said, would you abolish antitrust law? He said, sure, antitrust law is irrelevant. It may have had some relevance in the old days. He, he believed that. That's not correct either, by the way. But he said it's certainly irrelevant in a, in a world market with international competition and, and trade barriers going down. Uh, no, I don't think these people are ignorant at all. I, I don't think there's any political percentage in doing it. There's no political percentage in taking that position. Why would Senator Kennedy take that position, even though he, know, he might know, and I'm almost sure he does know, that, uh, uh, that Sanders all didn't raise prices? Well, I've had some exposure. The book certainly has not been, been a bestseller. <laughs> Uh, I, I think colleagues in the field perhaps uh, know now of my work, my casework. It's a, it's, a, it's a long, gradual, slow process, but I'm not getting any younger. <laughs> Other questions? <laughs>
Thank you very much.